Welcome to the Military History Museum of the Bundeswehr in Dresden. And today we look at the Luftfaust A and B, or better, what is left of them. The Luftfaust B later would be renamed into Fliegerfaust, which some of you might know from Battlefield 5. And as you might suspect, the actual history and the portrayal in the game diverge a bit. Note that Luftfaust literally translated means air fist and Fliegerfaust means plane fist, although be aware that Flieger was also used for pilots as well. First off, why was such a specific weapon developed? After all, Germany had various different anti-aircraft guns to just show a few of them. One part of the answer is quite obvious. The German forces were under almost constant air attack in the late war, especially on the Western Front. This becomes also rather obvious if one looks at German publications. For instance, pamphlets and regulations were released to use all kinds of weaponry like rifles and machine guns against planes. Now you might note while well, rifles and machine guns are rather obvious weapons for that. Yes, I agree, but the Leichte Infanteriegeschütz 18 which you can see here, is not. And the pamphlet also contains firing data for its bigger brother, the heavy infantry support gun, which had a caliber of 150mm with a rather steep firing arc, which I would call a rather unconventional weapon for this endeavor. Additionally, the Luftfaust is a rather special weapon, so the question is whether there were any specific requirements for this weapon that differed from regular anti-aircraft guns. According to Fleischer, the requirements were as follows. Recallless one-man weapon, similar to the Panzerfaust. Weight in firing position, 2 kg. Firing modes, spread or shotgun. Note, this is basically a requirement to have dispersion. Projectile velocity, 300 meters per second, which is about 1080 km per hour or 671 miles per hour. Effective firing distance, 500 meter with 10% dispersion of a trajectory length of the projectile salvo. Self-destruction of the 800 meter trajectory, which is about 2600 feet. Finally, reloading capability. This requirement was added later. Particularly important is the relationship to the Panzerfaust here, where a one-man weapon is used against a complex weapon system like a tank, or in the case of the Luftfaust, an aircraft. The company that developed the Panzerfaust was also given the contract for the Luftfaust. This relationship will become even more apparent once we take a closer look later on. A document from Remember 1944 about the planned troop trial indicates the one-man weapon aspect as well. With an allocation of 600 devices per division, it is possible to equip each rifle or machine gun squad, have a weapon's firing position and the command post with one device. The remainder will be considered for use in the rear services of the division. So while some people refer to a mortar as the poor man's artillery, the Luftfaust should become the poor man's flak. Before we continue, we need to make sure we get the names correct. Since looking at the available information, there seems to be quite some inconsistency with names, particularly on Wikipedia. Generally, the following names appear. Luftfaust A, Luftfaust B, Fliegerfaust A, Fliegerfaust B, and of course Luftfaust and Fliegerfaust. Based on my access to primary sources and leading literature on the topic, the names Luftfaust B and Fliegerfaust are very likely correct, whereas I have not seen any evidence for Fliegerfaust A and B. Luftfaust B and Fliegerfaust I've seen myself in primary source documents. Additionally, a secondary source note that on the 4th February 1945, the Luftfaust B was officially renamed into Fliegerfaust. As such, in this video, Luftfaust B and Fliegerfaust are used interchangeably. The case of Luftfaust A is less clear cut. I have not seen any primary sources with the name Luftfaust A in it, but the name is used by both Hahn and Fleischer. Since documents mention the Luftfaust B or refer to it as Luftfaust of Serie 2, it implies that there was a predecessor. Logically, the name Luftfaust A would make sense, but we know, at least for German tanks, that naming was not always so straightforward. For instance, the Tiger I is the Ausführung E, and the Tiger II the Ausführung B, whereas for the variants of the Panther, in chronological sequence are Ausführung D, A, G and F. 
As such, Luftfrost A seems logical, but that might not be enough in this case. What about the Fliegerfrost A and B? Here I have not seen any primary source evidence, neither do Hahn nor Fleischer use these names. One might argue since Luftfrost B was renamed into Fliegerfrost that the addition of the letter is appropriate. I disagree since from the data available Luftfrost A was a prototype and discontinued before the term Fliegerfaust was officially adapted. Of course, I have not seen all sources, yet so far I have not seen any evidence. Since we got that flank covered, let us take a short look at the Luftfaust A of the Military History Museum of the Bundeswehr in Dresden. Development for this weapon started in July 1944. At the top of the weapon you will notice a rather similar looking mechanism. This looks pretty much like the aiming and firing device of the Panzerfaust, which we took a detailed look a few months ago and that also expands heavily on my first Panzerfaust video. Anyway, as you can see, it has four barrels with a length of 1 meter or 3.28 feet. These barrels fired the rocket. So let us look at those. Some of you probably might know this is not a regular rocket. This is a modified Minengeschoss, mine projectile. So a projectile of a Luftwaffe machine cannon. Indeed, these are 20 mm projectiles that were fitted with a rocket and fins. The fuse was also adapted as well. Han notes that the maximum speed of such a rocket was 380 m per second, so about 1370 km per hour, or 612 miles per hour. The trials showed that the general concept of the Luftfaust was suitable, yet the main issue with the Luftfaust A was that the dispersion was too large, the coverage and range too small. Another problem was that it was a disposable weapon like the Panzerfaust, yet a more resource saving weapon was favored. Which brings us to the next step in the development, namely the Luftfaust B, which is also in the permanent exhibition at the MH in Dresden. Jens Wiener will give you a short overview of its history. You can see here to my left side the Luftfaust B. It has, in comparison to the Luftfaust A, nine barrels. The Luftfaust A only had four barrels. As the Luftfaust A, it was shooting with two centimeters rockets. Those rockets had the rocket itself and a two centimeter grenade from machine cannons that were used by the Luftwaffe. The Luftfaust you can see here is a found in the earth of Saxony at the outskirts of Leipzig, which is more common than other foundings of the Luftfaust in the soil because uh, in Leipzig was, was the production side of the Luftfaust. So that's no wonder we found Luftfaust in Leipzig, but some were also found in Dresden and there is also known, there are also known some photographs in Berlin where the Luftfaust uh, B was used. Note that although both Luftfaust use projectiles from the Luftwaffe, the rockets of the Luftfaust A and B version were quite different. In November 1944, the order for 10,000 Luftfaust B with 4 million rockets was given. Several documents also mention the distribution numbers for each branch of the Wehrmacht in terms of Luftfausts and ammunition. Namely, 6,500 Luftfausts and 2.6 million rockets for the Army. Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe should receive 3,000 Luftfausts and 1.2 million and the Kriegsmarine 500 Luftfausts and 0.2 million rockets. The planned production numbers seem to be confirmed by a document from 23rd February 1945 which also contains some further information. It is from the Organization Department 3, Organisationsabteilung 3, about the development of new weapons. The Luftfaust gets mentioned in the section New Developments, to quote, Air Defense. For defense against low-flying aircraft, the Luftfaust, which fires 2 cm tracer rockets with its 9 barrels. Total weight of the loaded device, 9 rounds, 6.5 kg, which is 14.3 pounds. Combat distance 300 to 500 meters, which is about 980 to 1600 feet. Scattering dispersion not more than 10% of the combat distance. A series of 10,000 devices and 4 million shot has been commissioned. Start of this major troop trial expected in early March 1945. 
As you can see by the technical data, this is clearly Luftwaffe B or Fliegerfaust since it was renamed officially in early February 1945. Although some of the data differs to the information that Fleischer provides. He notes a weight of 8.5 kg if the Fliegerfaust was loaded and 6 kg without ammunition. Additionally, the dispersion of 10% was a requirement that was never fulfilled. It was at 15-20% to during the war. Originally it was even higher. To reduce the dispersion, the 9 rockets were fired in 2 salvos. The first salvo had 4 rockets and after a delay of 0.2 seconds, the last 5 rockets were fired. So how many were actually produced? We know that the first production run called for 10,000 pieces and 4 million rockets. Fleischer notes that the first delivery of 100 Luftwaffe B was ready for the 21st January 1945, yet that there was a shortage of ammunition. Both Fleischer and Hahn note that about 80 were used in troop trials at the end of April 1945. So the number was very likely above 100 and far below 10,000. Of course, an important question about this weapon is, was it actually effective? As far as we can tell and as far as we know, it was not effective. Um, maybe it had a little bit of um, effect on um, that Allied pilots had a little bit of fear when they saw some, somebody was shooting on them in their airplane. But as far as we know, it was not effective. The Luftfaust A was it not? Definitely, because that's the reason why the Luftwaffe B was developed. And the Luftwaffe B was captured by the Americans and they also captured an officer who was responsible for the development of the Luftwaffe, an Oberleutnant. And the Oberleutnant told him, told them everything they need to know, the Americans in this case. And the Americans also cap captured some working Luftwaffe Bs and they tested this and they never developed it further and you don't see any weapons like this. So let's say it like this, the Luftwaffe was more or less a weapon of desperation. Maybe it could have done a little bit an effect in, at the end of the war if it was a little bit early. But today you see there are the man pads with the guided missiles. I think those are working anti-aircraft missiles, but the Luftwaffe was it not. Fleischer notes that the dispersion was too large and the speed of the projectile was too slow, yet that there are no reports of the actual effectiveness in the field, although he quotes the following. On the basis of the test firings carried out on balloons, it must be said, however, that the prospects in combating low-flying aircraft are not too great, since first of all the initial velocity of the projectile of 250 meters per second is far too small. Additionally, to the rocket propulsion, a very strong uneven dispersion occurs. Furthermore, the simultaneous firing of the projectiles strongly influences each other. The hit pattern of nine projectiles is very uneven and far too large, even at long combat distances, which are between 300 and 700 meters. Note that I think this should not be long but short combat distances. One minor addition here to the effectiveness. One major problem for ground forces suffering from enemy air superiority was the moral impact. To quote about the Allied experience in 1941, Weston's report, much like that of the Bartholomew Committee, stressed the moral rather than the material impacts of air power. At Malamy Crete, after several days of strafing, only one NCO had been killed and three other ranks wounded. The effect produced on the troops, he said, appeared out of all proportion to the actual damage inflicted. As such, giving the soldier on the ground a weapon that at least gives the impression to be able to fight back to a certain degree likely would raise morale. Additionally, the instruction for the troop trial of the Fliegerfaust particularly noted that the main role of the weapon was air defense, not the destruction of enemy planes. It stressed that the weapon should be used in mass and as such would be considered effective if the enemy plane had conducted their attack above the self-destruction range of the projectiles. Hence the Luftwaffe should force the enemy aircraft to a higher altitude or otherwise drive them off. See Chifton's talk here where it discusses virtual attrition, which is the modern technical term for it. To summarize, the Luftwaffe B, later renamed into Fliegerfaust, 
was a German unguided man-portable multi-barreled ground-to-air rocket launcher. It should provide the regular infantrymen with a weapon to discourage enemy aircraft from low-level attacks. The main problems were the large dispersion and limited speed. Similarly, the intended use called for the mass employment of such a weapon, which considering the shortage of German resources was a major issue. This is also reflected by the switch from a disposable weapon to a reloadable one. Of course, the potential effect on morale, which is often forgotten, must also be mentioned. Although it is hard to quantify and considering the overwhelming odds, it might hardly have an impact. Then again, the Western Allies predicted the collapse of the Wehrmacht for 1944. Instead, it went into a surprising, even though futile, offensive in winter 1944. Finally, be aware that I found various conflicting information in the literature. I mentioned a few, but clearly not all discrepancies. As always, take everything with a grain of salt. Big thank you here to Dr. Jens Wehner and the Military History Museum of the Bundeswehr in Dresden. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. Special thanks to Justin and Andy for discussing some technical terms and translations. Special thanks to all my supporters for making trips to museum and the military archives possible. As always, sources are in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.